when you're writing stories. Um, you take pieces of reality and pieces of imagination and you put them all in a container like a kaleidoscope and you sh shake them up and then you turn the bottom the way you do in a kaleidoscope until it's the pattern that you want. So I'm a New Jersey girl from birth and when I went to college, I went to New Jersey College for Women. But after a couple of years, it was my sister's turn to go to college, and my parents really couldn't swing to tuitions. So Lois went to NJC, and I switched to Newark Rutgers. Very unhappily, very resentfully, I had all my friends in New Brunswick. And I just wound up having an amazing education and a wonderful time there, much to my surprise. Well, it's a very modest, modest school. It was, uh, there was virtually no campus. It seemed to me we sat in a park uh, when we wanted to hang out, and it took me two buses to get there. But um, there were a group of us who were, you know, for better or worse, the intellectuals of, of the school. And um, teachers liked us. They liked us because we were hungry and eager for knowledge. We hung out with each other, and um, we also would sometimes after class go across to this tavern and have a drink or a Coke with the teachers who uh, got a kick out of us because we were so hungry and who we got a kick out of for paying attention to us. So it felt, it felt very precious. There was Professor Biederman, who was the philosophy professor there. And I took every, I, I was a history major, but I took virtually every course in philosophy. And I was a real pain in the butt of a, you know, young intellectual. I it could be a little irritating and considerably pretentious. And I remember saying, um, oh, Professor Biederman, I just discovered this great new uh, uh, philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre. And, you know, he just explains the universe. And I remember him saying, Madam? Um, I have read John Paul Sartre, and I cannot fit him in any part of my universe. And uh, uh, he would also plead with me to please not fill three damn blue books at every exam. <laughs> He's like, sort of calm down. Um, so there was there there was Professor Biederman who. Uh, People used to love his classes. People, there would be standing room in his classes. He was very dramatic and very brilliant. Then there was Professor Jewell, who taught the history of French culture. And as a little groupie, I had a book that said, Jewels, Jewels. And I would write down every brilliant thing. And I can still remember him talking about the Albigensian crusade, the crusaders up to their knees in blood. He was. You know, he was very eloquent and passionate about French culture and filled me with it. Uh, Professor Huberman, who taught um, modern poetry, um, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Frost, Eliot, Yeats, and um, Auden. I mean, it's amazing. I, I can't tell you my social security number, but I can, I can remember these details. And it was, a, it was you know, a great thrill to meet those poets for the first time in my life and uh, to learn about them. I was absolutely floored by Newark Rutgers. It looked, I mean, if somebody had showed me a picture and said, what is this? I would not have recognized the Newark Rutgers I went to. I went to a poor school where uh, that people went to because they either couldn't afford it or um, some of them were married and they were living in the area. I, you know, I returned to this amazing, you know, tons of buildings, grounds, a cafeteria that is feeding food to about, you know, 30 different ethnic groups because it is so multicultural now. You know, um, the brilliant Jane Ann Phillips running a graduate program there. The, um, it was, I, I was stunned, I, and I was very thrilled. 
being a writer is something I wanted to do all my life. Um, at the age of seven, I was sending out poems on line notebook paper and a very sharp um, number two pencil to all the women's magazines my mother read. And uh, it was the only thing I ever wanted to be. It made my parents very nervous because uh, my first poem was an ode to my dead mother and father, both alive at the time and quite irritated. I wanted to be, go out, roller skate, want to be Shirley Temple or somebody normal like that. And I realized um, that every poem I wrote for, you know, I think from the age of seven until uh, I got married had a corpse in it because my mother's favorite poem was Annabelle Lee. You remember that with the sepulcher down by the sea? I didn't think a poem could be a poem unless there was a dead body in the poem. So I had dead dogs. I had dead families. Um, I, I was a pretty grim. I, I wasn't personally grim, but my poems were pretty grim. And, didn't make my parents feel too good about that being my career choice. So I always, I never got a word published until I was in my 30s, but I started sending out when I was seven years old. When I got married and, and moved to Washington, I got a job working for Science Service. And that was a science organization that ran the science fairs, but also published books through, you know, regular public, normal, commercial publishing houses. And um, I, was, I, I was an editor there. And um, the guy who was supposed to write a book on the NASA space program couldn't at the last minute. So they asked me whether I would write a book on the NASA space program. And I came home whining to my husband saying, I finally got a chance to write after all these decades of dreaming. And they want me to write about space. And I don't even know where space is. And as a Washington Post reporter, and as a good reporter, he said, say yes, we'll figure out where space is. And I did. <laughs> so I wrote a bunch of science books, considering the fact that I'd been a disaster in science and the only person in college who had to be issued a second frog because I was so bad on dissection the first time. It was amazing that I wrote science books. The first book I wrote was called The Village Square, and it was a book of poems about how a nice Jewish girl from New Jersey goes to Greenwich Village to live a life of wicked, wild abandon, and finding it difficult with her mother calling her once a day to say, don't do it. Whatever you're thinking, don't do it. So that was, that was the book that was, was first published, and um, I, uh, I appeared on, I think, Barbara Walters television program um, hawking the book and somebody from a publishing company for children asked me to uh, if I'd be interested in writing a children's book and I had been a children's book editor in New York and I had loved 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 children's books so it was a huge thrill for me. I always wrote books for them or about them or to solve certain problems. I mean, I wrote The Tenth Good Thing About Barney, which is a book about uh, the death of a cat because our oldest son you know, had this very touching conversation in which um, he said, you know, um, he started asking about death, mommy, am I going to die someday? You said, you know, the right answer, yes, yes. Everybody dies, but not for a very, very long time. Um, but do I have to die? Yes, yes, we all have to die, but not for a very, very, very long time. And then he started crying and saying, Mommy, I don't want to die. And in my lowest moment as a mother, I said, maybe they'll invent something. <laughs> so after that, I decided I'd better figure out something to write that would address the issue for myself and for my son. When he was little, when I, when he was four years old when I read this book to him in manuscript form, Alexander and the Terrible Horrible No Good Very Bad Day, and I wrote it for Alexander because he had more than a share of bad days, and I thought it would cheer him up to re hear a story about it. And his reaction, he got absolutely furious with me. He said, why are you giving me this bad day? Why don't you give it to Nick? Why don't you give it to Anthony? Uh, why me? Why me? And I said, honey, you know, book hasn't been published yet. We could change it to Stanley and the Terrible Horrible or Walter, but then your name won't be in great big letters on the front of the book. So he said, keep it, Alexander. 
and over the years he has, I think, come to be very fond of it. I invented the phrase, I'm having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, and it has become part of the language. I mean, I have a great big, huge file, and it goes on forever, and I can't tell you how thrilled I am that, that it has become part of the language. Cheney's having a terrible, horrible, or this baseball player, or, you know, it, just, it comes up all the time. And I said to the Newsweek reporter, he said, how come it's now in, in the language all of a sudden, all, of the, all over the place? I said, how old are you? And he said he was, he was my son's age. I said, you guys are ruling, you know, you're running the world now, and you grew up on the book. That's why it's in the language. It is very, very thrilling. I think it would be for any writer to have words that are their original words become part of the uh, language. I love characters who I call hard likes, hard to like, hard likes. Um, we have Maurice Sendak and his Wild Things, Max, and I and um, Shel Silverstein. Shel Silverstein writes about very naughty kids, and the book of my childhood that I love so dearly has one of the most difficult, dour, grumpy heroines in history, The Secret Garden. Mm -hmm. um, and not only is she difficult, but so is um, her friend Colin, who is lying in bed being autocratic and obnoxious. Um, my, my newest children's book, the one that called Lulu and the Brontosaurus, um, I went all out and Lulu is that kind of absolutely impossible, bratty, spoiled, tantrum -y girl. And I had such a good time with her. And I love, I, I think it is so comforting to kids to know that they're not the only people on the planet who have these naughty inclinations and think these wicked thoughts and, you know, would like their rival to trip down the stairs. Oh, it's very, it's very hard to pick a favorite among, um, among your books because the, the books do different things in the, for themselves and for me. I mean, writing, writing poetry is taking a whole bunch of ideas and feelings and uh, perceptions and converging them, converging them into one word or one phrase, and um, writing articles, or writing um, psychological books is you know, elaborating and finding more and rich examples of what you're talking about. Um, writing for kids, I sort of tap into the smart ass six, seven year old in me and um, writing my books for adults, I'm talking about an ever older and older woman, um, you know, trying to figure out her place in the world and, um, and who she is and what she wants at different stages of development. So they all fulfill different needs for me, and I love the idea of trying new things. I, I wrote a novel because I wanted to try a novel. I've written three musicals that have been produced. And um, I like writing a little nervous, a little, am I, am I really gonna be able to do this? When I wrote Necessary Losses, which was a very complicated psychological book, which took me three years to write and was, you know, after years of writing children's books and funny poems, and everybody said, you know, that's too hard to pull off. I actually took the money for the advance and put it away untouched just in case I couldn't do it because it was such a leap for me. But I like, I like that part. That's why it's hard to pick anything because everything I did sort of stretched me a little bit or, or used me in a different kind of way.